Good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Side of Minutes podcast. My name is Max, and I'm joined by Flynn, and we've got some cool topics to go through today. Uh, first of all, a South American bank got hit by a cyber attack. Then Ticketmaster has had a bit of stress in uh, their stuff recently, and we've got a little bit on shady terms of service practices. So just recently, in the last month or so, we've seen probably three or four cases where uh, certain companies are giving you the option to opt out of their services or uh, things that are sort of aligned with their services, which, um, yeah, and one of the big players there is Apple. So um, stay tuned for that. Flynn, you wanted to give us a little bit of a rundown on the South American bank attack? Yeah, so basically what's happened is uh, not exactly groundbreaking stuff here. Third-party attack, we keep seeing it uh, happen again and again and again. Uh, I think at the moment they've notified that about 57,000 customers uh, have been affected. Um, I think there's, there's still investigation into what the extent of what's going on. But basically, we just wanted to do a quick touch base with this one because uh, we've been talking about a lot about third party, and especially in Australia with CPS 230 and stuff coming up. But it goes to show that third party and supply chain attacks is a uh, a global thing. It's such a uh, critical way that attackers get into your systems, how they expose you and exploit you. Yeah, no, 100%. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we can never really stop saying that you know making sure that you're keeping an eye on your third parties and checking your exposure it's such an important thing to do but you know it's just it always seems to be um the weakest link uh at the moment yeah so difficult to do as well yeah but yeah so this ticket master attack as well so there's a bit of an interesting uh scenario so a ticket master is sort of known for not having the best practices and i think this attack actually stemmed from hacktivism or some level of hacktivism at least so for people that aren't aware uh ticketmaster got hit by a cyber attack that i think it was was it 500 million users data got taken? 560 million yeah yeah so not a small amount of people's data got taken and the threat actors asking for a five hundred thousand dollar, i guess margin to to uh, I think it's to to buy the data off them. So I think if Ticketmaster pays them, then they'll uh, stop putting the data on the internet. But then if it's some other person gets it, then they're just gonna, you know, just sell, try and sell it for the highest price. I think 560 million users' data is actually for 500k is rather cheap on the as as far as it. Yeah, I think I think there's a bit of sort of conspiracy around this one that it may not the the group's claims may not be entirely accurate because. A, as you said, 500,000 things for 560,000 is not a crazy amount to ask for. Yeah. Oh, for 500 million, sorry. And, you know, a lot of people are saying it's a bit of, it could just be a publicity stunt because, you know, a lot of people don't like Ticketmaster. As you said, they've had a bit of shady practices uh, in the past, not necessarily cyber related. Mm. Um, but I think at the moment, from everything I'm seeing is that it's a uh, potential. I believe Ticketmaster is yet to make a statement. Uh, a lot of Aussies as well are supposedly uh, affected by this. Yeah, and I think um, the the, pri- the attack sort of stemmed from Ticketmaster having a monopoly over the online ticket sales industry. I'm pretty sure that's where it came from. Yeah, so it's about, it's by the group Shiny Hunters, which have been around for a couple of years now as well. It, basically what they're saying they have, what Shiny Hunters is saying they have is full names, uh, addresses, phone numbers, partial credit card details, and order and t- transaction info. So... Um, not like absolutely scathing data, but mm-hmm. definitely um, worrying data is there considering the extent, you know, 560 million. Um, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a lot. And I mean, I'm a bit surprised Ticketmaster hasn't responded. Uh, you know, it's usually companies that are that big uh, take this a bit more uh, seriously when this kind of stuff happens or like if, if the claims are exaggerated or you know, they're there to shoot them down a bit more. We've heard nothing from Ticketmaster, and it's uh, the 31st of May at the moment. And this, I think it's been, the word's been going around for about about a week already. So, yeah, there seems to be a bit of um, hearsay, she say. So the, the Department of Home Affairs said they have confirmed it is aware of a cyber incident impacting Ticketmaster. Right. So that makes it sound like something has happened, but maybe the extent of what has happened is still unclear. 
I guess we'll we'll move on to kind of the meat of this episode. So shady TOS practices. There's a few cases of this running around at the moment. Um, namely, it's Discord, Slack, and Apple, actually. Um, so we'll start off with Discord. So with Discord, how that sort of came about is... So it was an update to their terms of service where they said that... I forget the exact name of it, but it basically means that you're not able to participate in a class action lawsuit against them if anything happens. And they it's kind of a, a bit of a sketchy one to add to your, um, to your terms of service because it's not very seen well in the public eye when you do this sort of stuff. But let me just get the name of it, actually. So it's called forced arbitration. So what forced arbitration means is that when you want to sue a company, if you signed a contract or agreed to terms of service that had forced arbitration, it means that, yeah, you can't band together with a group of individuals and do a class action. And class actions usually go for a lot more money. There's They're a lot more successful because you've got all these people collectively trying to go after a company and it's not it's not you versus the company. Whereas if you've signed and agreed to forced arbitration, if you want to take legal action, you have to go it all on your own. So you have to take on you know, Discord's entire legal team and whoever they want to hire just based on you and whoever you want to hire. You're totally on your own. Um, and, you know, people were saying that, oh, who cares? Like, I doubt we're going to sue Discord or, you know, I doubt we're going to be able to do it successfully anyway. It's kind of besides the point because if Discord, say, leaked messages, uh, I don't know, regarding something, could be anything, and later on, those messages come public from a data breach or something and you're impacted in any way from those messages, then you could be entitled to some compensation compensation from Discord, considering that they in their I think they've got some stuff in their clause. You could you could probably get them for not storing that data or not encrypting that data successfully. But with signing forced arbitration, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to go it on your own. So just for anyone who wants to opt out of that specific case, um, you have to send an email to arbitration-opt-out at discord.com. Make your subject arbitration opt-out dash user ID, so your Discord user ID. Then uh, send a message that says, hello, this message is to exercise my right to opt out and not be bound by Discord's provisions requiring arbitration. And then just put in your user information, so your email uh, that's linked to your Discord account, and also your user ID. So sending that email <clears throat> means that you opt out of this arbitration, meaning that if you want to sue Discord in future, then you're able to do that in a class action scenario. If not, then um, then you won't be able to. Um, so Slack was actually a, a similar situation, not in terms of what they're doing differently with their terms of service, but what they, how you opt out of it. Um, basically, what happened is that Slack is training your Slack data for their AI and their ML models. Um, what they've said is, that is happening because, you know, there's a little bit of an uproar around this is they're just doing it for stuff like channel and emoji recommendations and search results um, and whatnot. Uh, that being said, you know, it can be a bit disturbing thinking, oh, what if my messages are being used to train a model? Um, and, you know, that's I'd say that's rightly so to be concerned about that. Yep. Um, the way you opt out is very, very similar to how you would with Discord. So basically you just say like, hi, our workspace is this, this. Um, and as per, you put the actual privacy principles within there. Um, so just link the privacy principles. Um, we want to opt out of using uh, our data to train Slack's models. Um, Slack has been a bit better on um, their end in terms of actually, you know, addressing this. So apparently when you... Um, when you message them saying you opt out, they reply fairly quickly and they just say, yeah, your opt out's been completed. Um, and they give you more information about, you know, what, what I just read, basically saying that this is what we use to train our models. Um, and, you know, the AI model is, is a separate product in itself. It's not within Slack. Uh, but that being said, you know, having your data out there, especially with Slack, I've actually seen some companies use Slack to basically have a lot of business stuff on there which seems a bit suspicious i'd, I'd recommend using an end-to-end -end encrypted sort of service and maybe not a third party um 
it's just not an unnecessary third party once again. Yeah, and, and I know that um, there's lots of corporations that use Slack. There's heaps of them. And oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ha- having that data put into a language model that you know we've seen that researchers are able to, with some effectiveness, and in some cases, extract data from these language models by doing uh, some quite sophisticated attacks. Uh, it means that you know potentially your work <laughs> stuff could be. Um, you know, given to, to threat actors who are able to um, look through uh, the training data of an AI model. It's not the first time we've seen training data leaked. ChatGPT was guilty of it when it started out. And, um, and you know, lots of other language. Big Farmer was, was as well, like yeah. based ones as well. Yep. Um, yeah. Very, very common attack poisoning, um, AI poisoning to get certain information out of there. Yeah, not poisoning. It's a, uh, it's something else. It, it, I can't remember the exact attack, but um, it's a very common thing that happens. Well, not common, but it's a, it's an attack known for for AI models. Um, so yeah, setting it's similar to the Discord saying that email is the best way to opt out of it. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And yeah, we'll sort of transition this onto our uh, a big one uh, just for today. So. Apple has updated their terms of service, kind of detailing how their AirTag system works. And this is actually a really interesting one. So what their AirTag system does is, as we all know, you have an AirTag, it communicates to other Apple phones that are around and about to try and like triangulate where that AirTag is so it knows where it is. And pretty much anywhere in the world you can go, there's going to be Apple phones, so you're going to be able to find an AirTag. What we didn't really know up until now was that they were also collecting nearby router BSS IDs. Now, what that means is your router name. So when you set your router name up, when you connect to your Wi-Fi on your phone, that name of your router, they've also been collecting any nearby router names and then also sending them back to Apple. So what this means is that Apple have a database somewhere and if another phone or another AirTag goes past those same BSS IDs, it can use that as a metric to tell where it is. So Apple has router names and then locations. So your router name will be showing up on a map at a certain location, probably your home, just whenever uh, whenever an AirTag goes past your house. So this is a bit of a, a, a bit of a weird one because technically, right, they're not doing anything intrusive. Like I could do the same thing if I walked past someone's house. Say I spent a year traveling around Sydney with my laptop, accumulating everyone's router names and then putting it in a database and being able to circle any point on a, on a map of Sydney and looking at the router names in that location. Anyone could really do this. The issue is that it's at such a large scale and the map is so, uh, yeah, so huge that you know it's basically everyone. Everyone's router names is put in Apple's database. And Apple didn't actually put it in their terms of service and they didn't actually tell people they were doing this until um, just recently. They, they didn't tell people that you were able to opt out of it either. That was a big sort of problem. Like up until a few weeks ago, you had no say. Your Apple, regardless, your router was put in um, in Apple's database. Yeah, and they did it in quite a sneaky way from, uh, if I recall collect correctly, they just kind of updated the terms of service and didn't kind of say anything. Yeah. Or maybe it was the website itself, but I'm not sure. But it definitely was a little bit shady how they did it. Um, I'm not actually entirely sure how you opt out of this one, if you can at all. Yeah, so you actually can opt out of this one as well. Uh, the way that you're doing this is by changing your router name to put underscore no map in it anywhere. So just on the end of your router name, say it's like Big Pond 510 or whatever, you would put Big Pond 510 underscore no map. And that means that when an Apple phone or an AirPod, AirTag, sorry, when that goes past your house, it's not going to uh, send that router to Apple's database. So if you wanted to right. stay a kind of fully anonymous in what your uh, router is and about where you are, I would recommend changing your router name to something different than what it is now. Just change it uh, a little bit and then add underscore no map onto the name, just append it on there. And that means if, say, if someone walked past your house or if uh, a data breach happened uh, from Apple and someone wanted to find out where you live based on your router name, just, uh, I don't know, the logical leap in there, but 
<laughs> if they wanted to do that, they could. Um, whereas now, if you change your name, it's not going to have association to what shows up in Apple's results. Yeah. yeah. I don't think this one's going to be like, it's like a crazy um, security thing, like issue, but uh, it's interesting and it loops back to our stuff of like, you know, shady business practices and not being transparent about what's actually happening. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.